this week on the Back Table Podcast. It's hard to tell a family. I don't know. We've put you through therapy. We've done a DLB. We've injected a you know a deep notch for laryngeal cleft, right. and nothing is working. And sometimes maturation is just our best friend. Yeah. And we definitely see that that it just takes them a little time developmentally. When we're looking at maybe now they're walking, maybe now they're running, we have better core support, we have better neck control. So sometimes maturation is just our best friend in terms of feeding and swallowing. And that's a hard thing to tell a family. That's a hard thing to admit to yourself that you don't have the answer, but sometimes you're not going to, and a lot of times you're not going to in pediatrics. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. Hey, everyone, really exciting news. Our listeners asked and we have answered. We now have CME available. You can get AMA Category 1 CME for listening to Back Table and then filling out a reflection. You can find the CME links on the episode pages at backtable.com or you can also find the CME links in the show notes. It's a small cost for the credit, much less than you would spend at a conference, and it helps support the show. Powered by CMEFI, using AI technology to bring the right education to the right place at the right time. You can do this in just a few minutes. If you're already listening to Backtable, might as well get a CME credit for it. Again, this helps support the show and allows us to keep bringing you great content. Now on with the episode. My name is Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist at UT Southwestern here in Dallas, Texas. I'm so excited for our podcast today. My guest is my colleague and partner, Ashley Brown. Ashley Brown is a pediatric speech-language pathologist here at Children's Health in Dallas. She's an integral part of our complex airway and swallowing team and is truly an expert on pediatric aerodigestive disorders, including dysphagia, swallowing, and voice. She's a board member for the Society for Ear, Nose, and Throat Advancement in Children, also known as CENTAC. She is on the Medical Committee for Texas Speech-Language Hearing Association and is board-certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. She is here to talk to us today about the evaluation and management of the infant with dysphagia. Welcome to the show, Ashley. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Gopi. So Ashley, tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice. So I've been here at Children's for 15 years, actually. Um, Dr. Romaine Johnson and I started around the same time, so we've been partners in crime for a while now. I am on the airway management team here at Children's. That's a new program that started, um, I guess we're coming up on four years now, so it's been a little bit. And I staff all clinics within that, aerodigestive, voice, vent clinic, airway clinic, and also go on trait rounds with the team. Wow. Okay. So you have a very busy clinical practice seeing all kinds of, yeah, yeah, that's pretty awesome. And I also do all the swallow studies for ENT. I see. And that's why I uh, come to you with a thousand questions. Every day there's an inbox message uh, from me. (laughs) So I'm really excited about this topic because I think that whether you're a pediatric otolaryngologist in the air digestive, you know, super specialized to the pediatric otolaryngologist like me, who's maybe not a part of that, or the general ENT, you're going to have babies that come into clinic that there's some concern about feeding. So um, that's why I thought this would be a great topic. So for infants, and again, we're talking about infants um, under a year, how do they usually present to you when they're feeding difficulties? Yeah, so whether it be in clinic or just a PCP referral from the community to our outpatient clinic, generally the infants present to us because they're a failure to thrive. They're not gaining weight. They are pulling off breast or bottle frequently, maybe some reports of coughing, uh, watery eyes, red eyes when they're eating, not completing their feeds, super fussy during feeds, refusing. Is um, I would say the general referral reasons that we get when it comes to infants. And how old are they usually? Are they usually like early, early on, like a couple of weeks, a couple of days, or, or do some of them present a little bit later on? Yeah. So we will get them um, when they are a few days, maybe a couple of weeks old, all the way up until, like you mentioned, that 12 month old mark. 
probably our youngest patients are seen within our craniofacial weight check clinics that we have because when those babies are born with cleft lip and palate, they need to get in immediately, see the surgical team and the speech therapist because they require such specialized feeding systems. So those are probably our youngest patients, but I've done swallow studies on a baby that's about two weeks old. Okay. So there's quite a range. A very large range. And within that range, you are looking at rapid developmental changes. So a two-week-old infant does not equate a six-month-old infant. So when these kids, uh, babies come to you, how do you organize like your thought process and or like how, what kinds of questions? Are there the same basic handful of questions that you ask and then you kind of tease it apart? Like how do you look at these and then what kinds of questions are you asking? Yeah, so we definitely start with a standard set of questions, probably very similar to questions you would ask in your practice, asking about birth history and then getting into what brought you in today. What are your concerns? Tell me what a feed looks like in terms of quality, quantity, um, the time it takes the baby to finish. And from there, then you start delving into specific questions that apply to that patient. But there are definitely a set of standard questions that you start with that give you a good clue of what do I need to ask next. Okay. And then uh, what's your exam like? So with the exam, you know, after asking some of those questions, I feel like the whole time we as speech therapists are pretty good at looking at the whole patient. We are very holistic in our approach to any dysphagia, especially infant dysphagia. And so the whole time we are observing posture, tone. We do tone check, oral motor exam on the baby and not just focusing on the mouth. We're looking at trunk support. We're looking at how do the parents hold the baby during a feed. So that's kind of where we start. When we delve into the oral exam, again, we're looking at tone, but also range of motion, integrity of the structure. And then do you, you watch them feed every time when they're with you? Yes, we have instructions when they are scheduled for an appointment that hopefully they are hungry enough. We say for a snack, once you get a baby over a tipping point of so hungry, it works against us a lot of yeah. the time that they don't want to eat because they are so mad at that point. So we, yes, we do ideally observe a feed. Now we do have some infants that come in that are NPO, so that's a different exam, yeah. but we observe a feed. And during the observation of the feed, we are looking at the oral motor skills, the feeding pattern, the swallow pattern. We are looking at, are they self-regulating? Are they pacing themselves during the feed? What does the coordination look like in terms of the suck, swallow, breathe pattern? Because we know that small infants, you know, they're obligate nasal breathers. So they suck, swallow, breathe, suck, swallow, breathe. And if they are not pacing themselves and get into this bad pattern, you know, you're going to choose breathing over eating. And we get into some bad moments then if we're not coordinating the suck, swallow, breathe. And you breathe when you should be swallowing. Yeah. So those are all things that we look at during the feed. And so how do you know which babies you're like, okay, we're going to do some feeding therapy or, hey, we need to do further workup or further imaging or testing? So sometimes it's hard to tell, is this just strictly a feeding therapy kid or do we need an instrumental? Because the great majority, if you look at the research, anywhere from, you know, 80 to 90 percent of aspiration is silent. So they're not going to give you many cues that they are aspirating. So you have to take some other cues from them, given the comfort level. Are they frequently pulling off the bottle? Do they sound a little wet, gurgly? Is there some sort of respiratory history that is the reason that they were sent to us? And then that's where we would go for an instrumental. Sometimes the families get into us and it is just a utensil change of maybe they are overloading baby with a too fast to flow nipple and we just need to back them down a little bit. Sometimes they just need strategies to pace baby. But I don't, I think it's always a good idea to start with a bedside and a speech therapist observing a feed so you are not getting into unnecessary exposure to radiation with a fluoro swallow study. 
Um, so those are some of the clues that we take. Um, infants don't cough. That's not a small infants. That is not a reflex quite yet when they're very small that that develops over time. So that cough, is that something you should rely on as a clue that they need an instrumental? And when you say instrumental, are you saying video swallow fees? What, what are we talking about? Yeah, so we can do either. With breastfeeding babies, fees is really, if they are strictly breastfeeding, fees, which is flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, is really our go-to option if they are a strictly breastfeeding neonate infant because we cannot observe breastfeeding during a video fluoroscopic swallow study. And just because they breastfeed does not mean that they will immediately go onto a bottle and do a fluoro. We have gotten referrals for strictly breastfeeding babies that come in for a video fluoroscopic swallow study and they want nothing to do with the bottle. So fees is a good option for those strictly breastfeeding babies. When it comes to the video fluoroscopic swallow study, if they are full bottle feeders and we're really thinking we need, we'll need to change a lot about flow rate, possibly the viscosity, the consistency, you know, thickening the feed, and we'll maybe have to play around a lot. Uh, fluoro sometimes is our good option there because there's only a, so long someone will tolerate a scope in their nose. <laughs> and so we can observe a full feed with the fees because we don't have the constraints of radiation, but there is a certain tolerance level there for sure. Yeah. So as the referring physicians, should we be ordering a video swallow before we send them to you? Should they all, or like who should get imaging or workup before they're sent to you and who should it, and what, what do you want? So you know, that can be a little tricky, as I'm sure you know, to figure out. Does this baby need to go for a bedside outpatient evaluation or does this seem urgent enough that we need a swallow study within the next like two days um so you know maybe some of those clues would be if they really are not gaining weight they are failing to thrive you I know mean, we're trying to change the language around that because saying failure to thrive kind of puts the label on the parents that they are yeah. failing to do their job so we're changing the language around that but that's the most common way people know it right now and if there is some sort of respiratory history, then maybe they've been to the ED a few times because baby is having apneic moments or their breathing isn't right. They've turned colors. Maybe we need to do an urgent swallow study at that time. If baby is maybe just a little bit messy when they're eating, they have some reflux type signs, you know, frequent spitting up, vomiting after every feed, then maybe we don't need to go straight to fluoro and maybe need to think about referrals to some of our other colleagues. Let's get into the instrumentals. I guess first, if you could just explain that, you know, when you like a video and when do you prefer a fees and which ones, I guess, show you what? So we'll start with fees, the flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. So I've already mentioned that for strictly breastfeeding babies, that is our good option. We do breastfeeding fees in office. We've done them um, over in our acute care side. So that is good because we can get baby on breast. We can um, scope them, watch them swallow while breastfeeding because breastfeeding is very different than bottle feeding. And there have been you know, a study showing that even though they might aspirate during a bottle feed, they don't necessarily aspirate during breastfeeding. Baby has a little more control when they are breastfeeding than bottle feeding. So that's a good option before we start, especially thinking, let's start taking PO away from this baby. I like fees for our secretion management kids. If we are concerned that maybe this child baby is in PO, but we feel like they're not managing their secretions, Fees is really the only option and is the best option to look at, do they have copious pharyngeal secretions? Are they aspirating these secretions and not initiating a cough response to help clear those secretions? Because we know and we've seen from studies that have been put out fairly recently how detrimental aspirating secretions is on lung health. It seems that it is worse than aspirating food and liquid if you think about how kind of nasty our mouths are <laughs> and aspirating 
that those secretions that have mixed with maybe some bacteria in your mouth. I like the fees for our kids that are NPO. Maybe they only do a few flavor tastes, but we really want to expand on what they can do orally. Maybe give them a therapy plan. Uh, they can do a few tastes of liquid or puree. So I feel like those are good fees options. I um, also really like, you know, we don't encounter this as much in pediatrics, especially infant or head and neck cancer patients that have had a lot of radiation to that area. Do we need to expose them more, you know, with a video fluoro? Fees would be a good option because often those children, infants who, and we've had had a few infants who have had some head and neck masses that we have had to take care of. You get a better picture of residue with fees. Is it unilateral? Is it bilateral? How much is it? You get a better idea of how much residue there is. Um, so I like fees for those patients as well. But fees is also complementary to video fluoro and vice versa. Video fluoro is complementary to fees. They don't necessarily are meant to be done alone and one is better than the other. For our video fluoro, which is where most of our kids would fall, like I've mentioned, if we think we're really going to have to play around with flow rate consistency, uh, video fluoro really gives us a good picture. They did better if I paced them this many times. And also with video fluoro, you're getting the full oral picture and esophageal. With fees, you're only seeing that pharyngeal laryngeal space. So you are missing the oral and esophageal component. And so when you're kind of, you know, seeing these kids in your mind, what's your differentials that are like the common dysphagia or things that you're thinking of? So if you look at some of the research and numbers, anywhere from like 25 to 45 percent of like normally developing children and infants will have some sort of feeding difficulty. That is a large number. And I'm sure y'all can tell that from your practice that yeah. it is a large number because it's every day, all day. So sometimes they don't give you many clues as to what is going on. And they're, they're these seemingly normal aspirators and we can't quite figure out a differential there, which is very frustrating. But, you know, if we think about the most common you know, big picture that we're looking at, oral structure, so um, tongue tie, you know, one of them that we'll start with that's very popular right now to talk about tone. So have they had a HIE, a brain bleed? Have, were they born premature? Were they intubated for a long time? What kind of clues could prolonged intubation give you? Oral sensitivity being one of them. They were in the hospital for a long time, lots of things taped to their face. You can understand why they don't necessarily want to eat or like a bottle coming at their face or the therapist trying to do exercises with them. You know, they can be very orally defensive. Intubation tubes sitting in their mouth for a long time too affects the shape of the palate, which can affect bottle feeding, not getting that great seal that you need. Are they a cardiac baby? Do they have a cardiac? history? Have they had cardiac surgery? So when we think about our cardiac babies, they have a very low kind of energy reserve. So feeding is already an aerobic exercise. And then for our cardiac babies, that especially is true. And so maybe they don't want to eat for longer than five minutes. And then when you also you're thinking about cardiac history, is there some sort of immobile vocal cord involvement because there was injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which we see often. That is probably primarily what our voice clinic is, is children who have had a history of cardiac surgeries, PDA ligation. And so we're looking at vocal cord immobility. In general, do they have a history of syndrome? And so you start looking up those syndromes, trisomy 21, probably being our biggest one, Down syndrome. They're going to have a lot of tone issues there. Um, 22Q, the 101.2 deletion syndrome, so also known as DeGeorge. You know, some people label it DeGeorge. They all kind of come with their own set of difficulties that you really need to research what those syndromes look like in terms of feeding. Some other differentials, we definitely get more referrals, especially from swallow studies of this kid is not making progress in therapy. 
there may be one of those seemingly normal aspirators, we would like to look for a laryngeal cleft. Yeah. Um, I think that that is on top of mind with a lot of people now. And we are definitely diagnosing it a lot more, especially over the past probably five to 10 years. Yeah. I think, you know, it's there's such a spectrum and we tend to think about the cardiac kids and the trisomy 21 kids and the syndromic kids as being the most difficult. But I find that sometimes in our otherwise he- healthy quote, I don't know if nobody can see me, but I have my finger <laughs> quotes, that sometimes the like, you know, tongue tie and laryngomalacia kids or that six month old that's kind of always had a little cough, you know, when they've drink milk and are now finally coming to you. Those are to me can be very difficult as well, um, just because we know that not all tongue tie is the main issue. And even with that other, you know, otherwise healthy six month old with a, you know, there there might be something. Is there any like details or ways to kind of help tease those kids in terms of how to help think about etiology or things they might benefit from? How do you look at that group? Yeah. So you mentioned laryngomalacia, and that also is a large referral population that we have within ENT. And if we think about it in terms of also tongue tie, I think sometimes we get stuck on the visual of it. And, you know, tongue tie is not about the anatomy. It's about the function. Right. It's not about the visual. It's about the function. So when we think about laryngomalacia, when you think about it in that term as well, because we'll see notes that say, you know, myolaryngomalacia, we'll continue to watch, but they're showing all of these signs that they're stridulous during feedings is the time the parents notice it the most. They get a little junky, a little congested. They're not gaining weight. So is that mild laryngomalacia in that baby just enough to throw off that suck swallow breathe sequence where in another child they were doing fine with the exact same maybe appearance of yeah. the laryngeal tissue and so it has to be patient by patient kid by kid it cannot be this kind of box that we put them in of you have a tongue tie therefore you have a feeding difficulty or it looks like a mild tongue tie therefore you won't have a feeding difficulty And that's where best practice would be this multidisciplinary approach to everything. We should not expect our ENT colleagues to know it all about feeding. That's why we're here. We would rather you ask than order all of these exams or just say, we'll see you in six months. You know, there's a wide spectrum of how people handle it. Well, good thing I send you an epic message about once a week then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, For all we, my kids that I seek. <laughs> no, we never we never mind those no. questions because there are things that we have not thought of that you can offer. And then we might pick one little clue out of the message that you sent that you're like, oh, actually this kid probably needs to go to GI. This sounds yeah. like they are having some major GI difficulties and let's pull those colleagues in. And, you know, if we could see every dysphagia patient in the aerodigestive clinic, yeah. that would be wonderful. But the yeah. bandwidth is not quite there. So let's talk about some of the GI. Um, you know, I think I feel like I'm always asking, like, is there any history of reflux um, spitting up? Tell us a little bit about what you're asking when you're looking for GERD um, or reflux and Do they need to be actively spitting it up for them to have it? Is that, you know, and how does that play a role into your feeding evaluation? Right. So all babies have reflux, right? They have immature guts and they are messy and they spit up. There is silent reflux as well. They are not necessarily going to spit up all the time. And spit up does not mean that it's affecting them in any sort of negative way capacity. All babies do it. So it, again, is really looking at, you know, the parents have told me they spit up a lot. They're smacking their lips a lot during the feed, kind of have this sour look on their face. Is it affecting the feed? Is it affecting their growth? Is it affecting a happy, pleasant feed? Are, you know, the parents struggling and they're feeding the baby every hour because the baby has started to volume limit because they don't feel good. 
you know, the way, unfortunately, babies show you that they don't feel good is crying yeah. or um, not necessarily cooperating the way that they want them to because they cannot tell you how they feel. And so looking at those signs of pulling away from the bottle, lots of um, maybe tummy discomfort, gas, sound like they're maybe swallowing a lot of air, which would then in turn with aerophasia, you get more reflux with that. So is it affecting the feet is what you need to know. Are they stooling like they should? Do they have, you know, constipation? They're not, they're going to volume limit at that moment. And if you have constipation, there's only some place the food liquid can go and it's going to start to, you know, possibly go back up the other way. So again, looking at how is this affecting the feet? Because you know, what do our GI colleagues get a little annoyed with us that sometimes we want to blame reflux <laughs> I all blame the time? It all the time. Probably. <laughs> it's so. like, you got reflux. Oh, yeah. Can we do steroids? Is there a place? You know, those are the two things. <laughs> yeah. So they probably do get slightly annoyed with us. But if you think of it in terms of is it affecting their feet? Is it affecting the volume? Is it affecting their growth? That's when you start thinking, I need to rope in my. GI friends because the baby's only job, you know, when they're very small is to eat and go to the bathroom. Right. And if both of those, either of those are messed up, we need to get our GI colleagues involved as well. And at the in the infancy, how much does something like a food allergy come into play? Or does that, you know, or and present as dysphagia, does that come at all? Um, I mean, I think Probably some food sensitivities, maybe some dairy, uh, milk protein sensitivities. Um, a lot of our moms do elimination diets if they're breastfeeding or doing express breast milk. How many you know, babies really have like food allergy? I, I don't think that that is necessarily maybe what we're looking at. It's more because you know, infants are going to be more formula, express breast, breast milk or breastfeeding, human milk based. So maybe a milk protein sensitivity, which again is where our GI colleagues get involved. Now, once they start transitioning to spoon feeding and parents are trying fruits and veggies and we start seeing, you know, rashes or some other signs of discomfort, once they start introducing more solid type foods, you know, then that's when we maybe start thinking food allergy. But in terms of very small infants that are still just um, breast or bottle based, you would think more milk protein, discomfort type signs when they're eating. And then what about, you know, we've talked about, you know, intubation history. We've talked about laryngomalacia, craniofacial. But what about just like nasal obstruction? How often mm -hmm. do you see nasal obstruction in, in infancy that is enough to cause trouble feeding? And, you know, they get six to eight colds a year, we say. You know, they whether, you know, I feel like that's your main group. And then, of course, you're going to have the history of piriform aperture or cranial atresia, but those are not common. So right. how often is in the nose and how so, does that present? Yeah. So I don't I don't feel like we have too many families that come to us that everything seems solely based on just a junky nose and they can't eat. And um, like you mentioned you know, it's going to be cold based if they go to daycare, um, maybe just some seasonally based kinds of things. And so then it's, you know, seems to be a fairly simple conversation of talking about nasal saline, those kind of things to help them with that. So if it's if it's just some of that junk, yes, when they are obligate nasal breathers, can it throw off their suck swallow breathe pattern? Yes. That's what we just talk about. Let's help baby along with some pacing to help with that coordination sequence. Coinal atresia, piriform aperture stenosis, they will, as we have seen, have difficulty with feeding. But generally, I feel like they do well with just some strategies. I don't know what you've seen necessarily with your patients that have come through, but uh, most of the time they do very well with some strategies, but getting your feeding therapy colleagues involved to help them yeah. with some pacing strategies generally helps them through. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that the otherwise healthy kid that catches a cold all the time isn't necessarily going to be the ones having the issues um, because you're right. Once they're about two months, 
uh, they're not as much of a obligate nasal breather. And then the colds, that's kind of when they start getting affected more. I mean, I feel like we do see a lot of in our clinic for, you know, four month old with nasal, the nose has been clogged for, you know, since they were born type of picture. And mm -hmm. like you said, it's supportive care, lots and lots of saline and going from there and just letting them grow. I think with the quinoa atresia or piriform aperture stenosis, whether, so quinoa atresia, if it's bilateral, you're going to have had to repair it and do surgery. Every once in a while, not a lot, not very often might you see an infant with unilateral that has some feeding difficulties with a URI or perhaps they have tri trisomy 21 or something. So there's other factors also playing a role like tone or, you know, every time that kid gets sick, there's issues with feeding. But I think that with a bilateral coanal atresia or peripheral stenosis, whether you've repaired it or not, there can, you know, when the nose is getting tighter, if there's restenosis or scarring, that feeding is always going to be one of the first things that tends to be affected and nasal flaring not being able to stay on. But again, those things aren't that common, right? Those pathologies aren't that common. So, and then, but that is always in my mind of, okay, we need to take a look. Maybe we need to go back and do something and redilate and things like that. Yeah. I think the kids who, um, the babies who've had the most difficulty with feeding when coenal atresia is one of the diagnoses on the table, generally, like you said, have some other comorbidities other than just coenal atresia. And there are, you know, degrees of obstruction, like you mentioned, unilateral versus bilateral, and when you're going to have to get surgically involved, these are not these long-term kids that like pop up in our clinic, you know, over the years that that's their only history. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Because if it's charge or something else, we're also thinking about a nerve, a vocal cord precess or yeah. a cleft or some other, you know, there's like, you, you know, 22, you know, there's stuff that we're thinking mm -hmm. about that might also play other roles. Right. Yeah. Charge is a, is a tricky one with a lot of cranial nerve involvement. And that is a, that is a difficult diagnosis yeah. in terms of feeding as well. Yeah. In terms of uh, feeding therapy, what, what is, what happens in like when they, okay, you're going to go see speech pathology, they're going to evaluate you and decide, oh, and now, okay, how are you doing? You're in feeding therapy. That's great. How are things going? I don't really know what actually happens though. Right. <laughs> so what happens during a session? I will say a very large part of what we do is family counseling and parent support and parent training. These are not adults that come into dysphagia clinic where it's up to them and their partner to navigate. This is a whole family. We have grandparents that come to every appointment with the parents. So you are counseling an entire family. And you can't forget that the parents are part of your evaluation and part of your therapy plan because they are the ones that are going to have to implement these strategies at home. You can't go home with them as much as maybe the families would like you to go home with them and do every feed with them. You have to do a lot of great parent training. So that is a very large part of therapy is making sure the parents are comfortable with the strategies, that they are continuing the exercises, if that's what you're doing at home, because, you know, one or two sessions a week does not necessarily translate to carryover. So you've got to train these parents and they are their child's biggest advocate. So they are a very large part of the therapy plan. But in terms of focusing on the child during therapy, there is a wide range of do they just need a change in nipple flow like we've talked about and really just following them for a few sessions to make sure that that strategy worked well for them. Sometimes these are very long-term therapy patients who need a lot of sensory and motor work. Sensory is a very large part of eating that sometimes I think gets missed and not talked about our little friends that like to overstuff their mouths. Are we looking at a sensory feeding problem that they really need that input where they just shove a, button, a bunch in their mouth and look like little chipmunks? So you have to think about the sensory as well. So they will do maybe some oral motor stretches. Do we have some hypertonia and we really need to work on stretching, stretching those lips for good lip rounding? Do we just 
by getting in there and maybe doing some sour or cold stimulation? Are we increasing that sensory input and working on their sensory system for oral motor, but also for swallowing? And then they move on to maybe some more of the complex like facial kinesio taping for also sensory input, but for some support, we use that a lot for our, our droolers, our secretion management kids that need a little help with lip rounding to keep lips closed so that they can't actually swallow their secretions. And then all the way on to neuromuscular electrical stimulation. Some people know it as their brand name, Vital Stem, but that is just the company. NMES is the actual therapy. Um, so there's a wide range. And if you are looking at a infant that has had kind of long-standing feeding problems, we talked about they are intubated for a long time and are very defensive. You are also just working on them having pleasurable oral experiences and being okay within you getting to the exercises and wanting to take some flavor taste PO trials. Well, who are the kids that need the neuromuscular stimulation? Is that just your poor tone kids or um, is no. there a criteria? Yeah. So, you know, again, it's all about function. We need to know what the deficit is before we treat it. What is the pathophysiology of their swallowing deficit? You can't just, you know, come in, do NMES without actually knowing what you're targeting and what the deficit is. And, you know, it gets a, it gets a bad rap, a bad name. There's not a ton of pediatric research out about it. And when we're talking in terms of NMES, we more and more pediatric dysphagia research is coming out, but it definitely lags behind our adult colleagues. Um, but that's how most things are yeah. in pediatrics, right? Yep. yep. So with the NMES, it can be that, you know, for lack of a better term, seemingly normal aspirators where we can't quite figure out. There's no other comorbidities that we have yet to figure out. And we use it, yeah, low tone, um, high tone, some of our CP kids, our secretion management kids, because NMES, you know, essentially the the easy way to describe it is you're inducing a muscle contraction. It's just like the, you know, it's like the TENS units you would use on your back or legs. So you're inducing a muscle contraction, but it also impacts kind of that surface sensory as well, because they are kind of short electrical pulses. And so this is kind of the theory behind it. Does it work for every kid? No, it does not. Do we see some good outcomes? Yes, we do. We need definitely more research on the long-term outcomes. Is this sustainable? As soon as the therapy is done, do they regress? So that, I think, is where we need more information. But you should be very thoughtful in how... You use it and recommend it because you need to know the pathophysiology behind their swallow deficit before implementing NMES because you need to know what to target and not go in blind. Yeah. Meaning where exactly you're going to, which muscles to stimulate and right. where you're going to so, place your electrodes based on what you see in the video swallow or what correct. you physically see? Yeah. So with the video swallow or the fees, there are different electrode configurations that, you know, in theory target different muscle groups. And so you, you go through training. Everyone who uses it goes through training and you get information and handbooks on these electrode placements target this group of muscles and this deficit pathophysiology you saw on a swallow study. So you have to be, you know, very precise about it. And, you know, it's not for, for every kid. A lot of our kids you know, we'll try it. We'll get NMES for a little while and we see no progress or benefit that may happen. But it's up to that treating therapist to really kind of think through the deficit and what they're targeting. Well, as we sort of start to wrap things up, do you have any final tips or pearls? I mean, these are hard, hard patients. Um, and like you said, there's a whole family aspect too, that you're looking at everybody and feeding such an important you know, especially for growing and quality of life that is so valued as part of, you know, it's part of, you know, life, yeah. if you will. 
So do you have any other final pearls for us or things that we should be thinking about or how we can make our practice better or how we should be looking at these kids differently or... Dysphagia is very difficult. There are days that I wonder why I do this all day, every day, but you get those. It's so hard. It is. But you get those small victories and it, you know, makes it all worthwhile. But it is very difficult because there are probably more times than not, I would have to say, is we often had to tell the families, I don't know and I don't know why. And I think it's okay to say, I don't know. We're so afraid to not have an answer for families. And I, that's why they come to us. They want to answer. But so much of it is unknown. And you are there to support them through the journey, which means they may be with you for several years, especially in pediatrics. And it's hard to tell a family, I don't know. We've put you through therapy. We've done a DLB. We've injected a, you know, a deep notch for laryngeal cleft right. and nothing is working. And sometimes maturation is just our best friend. And we definitely see that, that it just takes them a little time developmentally when we're looking at maybe now they're walking, maybe now they're running. We have better core support. We have better neck control. So sometimes maturation is just our best friend in terms of feeding and swallowing. And that's a hard thing to tell a family. That's a hard thing to admit to yourself that you don't have the answer, but sometimes you're not going to. And a lot of times you're not going to in pediatrics. And feeding is very emotional. You think about bringing this baby home and your only job is to keep them alive. And that is to feed them. And it is such a bonding, emotional experience for mom and dad, especially when mom is trying to breastfeed and she's having difficulty with that. And so you need to remember, especially when it comes to breastfeeding evaluations, tongue tie evaluations, that mom is also your patient. And where a multidisciplinary, including lactation and speech, really come into play there because maybe baby is doing okay, but mom needs help with her supply. You know, there are mouth and, you know, nipple mismatches and problems there that your lactation friends can really help you with positioning baby for optimal feeding. So mom is your patient at that moment too. It is not just baby. And like I mentioned, when we're thinking tongue tie, we need to think function, just not how it looks. And we'll tell you a lot. And so, you know, these are very difficult evaluations and they can be very frustrating. But I think as long as the families know that you're really trying to help them navigate this very tough part of their life, because it seems like our parents are okay with their kid not walking. They're okay sometimes, even, you know, if they're not saying as many words as they like. But feeding is such a family, community-based activity. We take such pleasure from eating. And even if the child is not showing the parents that they really have any interest in eating, That is a very hard thing for people who eat okay to connect with because we take such great pleasure from eating. And it is such a, and we're coming up on Thanksgiving, right? (laughs) So, I mean, that is what we base a lot of our celebrations and holidays around. So if you are the family that has that one kid that doesn't get to participate in that, that is very difficult. And I think that that is why a lot of us in, in terms of our feeding therapy colleagues, try not to go this NPO route. We try to give the family something because they will say, I just want him to have some icing on his first birthday so I can get that smash cake picture. Is that something we're really taking away from families, you know? So, because there is a big mental health component around yeah. this as well. I think that's a great point. Ashley, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today and more so for just answering all my questions all the time and helping me with these patients because I find that I find them to be truly difficult and wanting to make sure like because there's so much at stake um, that we're doing the right thing. So thank you for being such a resource and my partner in this. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. I would, you know, always rather be there to answer those questions and make sure the kids get what they need than people trying to blindly walk through this journey with these families. For sure. 
to our listeners. Thank you for, if it's your first time, thank you for checking us out. For any returning listeners, thank you for coming by again. You can find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Apple, and Ghana. Please follow us on Instagram and Twitter at underscore Backtable ENT. Remember to subscribe, rate, and like. We love feedback. Reach out to us for topics, ideas, speakers, or if you ever want to come on the show. And I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team lead is Karen Yen with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.